Westward Ho for Oregon and California. Who wants to go to California without costing them anything? As many as eight young men of good character who can drive an ox team will be accommodated by gentlemen who will leave this vicinity about the 1st of April. Come, boys, you can have as much land as you want without costing you anything. The government of California gives large tracts of lands to persons who have to move there. The first suitable person to apply will be engaged. G. Donner and others, Springfield, March 18, 1846. And thus begins the most ill-fated journey from East Coast to West Coast the United States has ever seen. You thought you had it bad in your games of the Oregon Trail and School Computer Lab? Just you wait. Did y'all play the Oregon Trail, Matthew? I didn't, but I'm familiar with it. And also, Paula, once I flew, right, yeah. from, uh, to L.A., mm-hmm. I had to, my flight was cancelled, I had to stop over at Texas. That's true, This can't be worse than that. Did you live? If you can call being in Texas living. Oh, (laughs) jeez. Also, I had to fly back. I ended up, I was flying to Nashville, and I ended up in New York City for like half a day. It was a whole, do you know what? I wish I was a part of the Donna Pine. (laughs) Welcome to Remember, Remember, the show about histories, mysteries, and did you know that the Oregon Trail stretched from Independence, Missouri to Oregon City, Oregon, was 2,000 miles long, and took between five and six months to traverse. Contrast that with my own journey from East Coast to West Coast when I moved to California. I drove in my 95 Honda Civic, and it took me about 11 days, and I was moseying. I feel like 11 days is ridiculous. I took a long time. I took my time. It took me 11 days. I could have done it in four days. Yes. If all you're doing is driving, sleeping and driving, it's about a four-day drive. Why am I so good at American geography? (laughs) Speaking of geography and context for you, Matthew. Oh, that's Matthew. I'm Paula. We're your hosts. The Oregon Trail could have crisscrossed the widest part of the UK about six and a half times. Look, it's not a competition. I'm just letting you, I'm giving like context for how long of a journey this was, how far it was. It's like Americans who are proud of the Grand Canyon. Let me tell you, the Grand Canyon, yeah, it was also there when you got there. Also, there's ancient Egyptian artifacts at the Grand Canyon. Look it up. It's really interesting. Sounds like a topic for a different episode. I love it. It was a long and dangerous journey, and thousands of people risked their lives to make it. None more famous, or infamous perhaps, than the Donner Party. If you aren't already familiar with the story of the Donner Party, spoilers, it's gonna get tragic. True though. But it didn't start that way. And I want to start by talking about how the party came together, how the first part of the journey went, and what led to the events that are so notorious... I don't think I could ever eat a Donner kebab. That was a joke at school when I was a child, because we learned about the Donner party at school. Donner kebabs are a British tradition. And really have nothing to do with the Donner. It's a completely different... It's a different way. I it's have to totally assume different. it's a different Donner. It's just a coincidence. It's spelled differently. We're lucky in that we actually have a few first-hand accounts of what happened. One party member kept a journal... Uh, One sent some letters back east detailing the journey while they were on it, and two of the young girls in the party wrote personal accounts, though those were written years later. So let's just agree to take them with a tiny grain of salt as they were very young during the trip, and their memories of what happened could be colored by time or other outside forces. Okay. Agreed? Unreliable witnesses. You heard it here first. So George Donner wrote the ad that I started the episode with. I'm in, by the way. If there's an engagement, I'm like, I'll I'll sign up if I can get engaged. You got any, like, (laughs) mid-20s women doing that trip? Uh, none of them single. No single mid-20s women went on this journey. Some single mid-20s men? Why are we offering this engagement, then? (laughs) Uh, Don't worry, once we get to the end, uh, any of the young girls who survive are left with no one in their family, and so they immediately marry. So George Donner wrote the ad I started the episode with, looking for people to join their party traveling to California. 
George and his brother Jacob, who were wealthy and successful farmers, decided to join up with James Reed, a wealthy and successful contractor, because it costs money to do these things, to head west. They gathered up their families and some hired help and left Springfield, Illinois, to meet up with a larger caravan planning to leave Independence, Missouri. I think that's how people in Missouri say it. Missouri? It can't be, but I think so. let's say it they is. I Missouri. Uh, Independence, Missouri in May 1846, which is about the latest you'd want to leave to make it before winter weather set in. Most people said you should really leave by mid-April to be safe. We don't know why the Donna Reed party left so late, especially because in their ad, they're like, be ready to go by the 1st of April. It's like invading Taiwan. Do it in April. Do it in April. You want to know what we're talking about? Listen to our previous episode about the Duck King. So this original party was 33 people. It was BYOB, I believe. Bring your own... Bring your own betrothed, it sounded like, honestly. George Donner, who was about 60 years old, his wife, Tamsin, their daughters, Francis, Georgia, and Eliza, who are six, four, and three, and two daughters from Georgia's previous marriage, Elitha and Leanna, who are 14 and 12. Tamsin's a nice name. Tamsin, yeah, you don't really hear that, but it is a nice name. Jacob Donner, his brother, was 56 and traveled with his wife, Elizabeth, and their kids, George, Mary, Isaac, Samuel, Louis, Solomon, and William, ranging in age from 14 to 3. God, how annoying this whole trip must have been for everyone involved with all those kids. <laughs> there are a lot of kids on this trip. Uh, the Donners also had some hired help for driving their wagons. Teamsters Noah James, who's 20, Samuel Shoemaker, 25, and family friend John Denton, 28. So there are some singles for you. So I promise this episode isn't going to be just one big genealogy list about who begat who. I believe Joseph begat Arimathea. Is that correct? I think that is correct, yes. Mm -hmm. I just, I don't want this to be another sensationalist retelling of a horror story, right? In doing my research for this, I found myself really caring for these people, so I want to try to humanize them a bit for you, which is why I'm listing out their names and ages like this. Yeah. The Reeds were James Reed, who was 46, his wife Margaret, their daughters Martha, who is also sometimes called Patty, Explain oh, that yeah, that, that that common nickname for Martha's. <laughs> I don't know Patty. why. Maybe her middle name was Patricia. I have no idea. Uh, so Martha slash Patty and Virginia. And then they had sons, James Jr. and Thomas. And then Margaret's mother, Sarah Keys, who was 75 at the time. And of course, their own hired hands, Eliza, who is a family servant, and her half-brother, Bayless. Teamsters, Walter Heron, Milt Elliott, and James Smith, all in their mid-20s. And a family friend, Hiram Miller. That's the original grouping. So when we're going across, right, mm -hmm. I'm assuming there are trails that are kind of set out for them. Yes, the Oregon Trail. But they're not like Lewis and Clark Correct. going out, bushwhacking their way all the way across the country, trying to find Native Americans exactly. to say, how do you cross this river? It was like there was a trail to go on. This, yes, those that are... is what the Oregon Trail was. It was carved out. It was basically like a, a traveled path that was cleared. And at this point, so many people, it's like the Great Migration is what they call it. Like so many people going along it that you could see ahead of you like a large group of wagon trains ahead, and then you look behind and a large group behind. It's like being on the 405 or something, you know, like sitting in traffic. I'd have been on that. I'd have been on it. It's a well-traveled journey. It's supposed to be, as long as you stick to the trail. Foreshadowing. So both Eliza, who was three during the trip, Eliza Donner, and Virginia, Virginia Reed, who was 13, later wrote about how prepared their families felt for the journey. So when she was three, yeah, so she had no idea, right? She just got told. She, yeah, that's the one mostly where I'm like, ah, it's hard to know really how much of this is her own memory. None of it. What was told to her by her father, what was told to her by her siblings. Like, it's hard to know how much of something like this sticks with you at the age of three. I don't know. None of it. None um, of it. But there is a lot of corroboration between what she wrote and what Virginia writes. And Virginia was 13 when it happened. They talk about their mothers packing up large amounts of new clothes to be worn in California. All the food and provisions packed away in their wagons. The money sewn into quilts. Large amounts of money <laughs> hidden away. 
That's like some Anastasia stuff when they tried to get the jewels out of Russia. That's right, yeah. exactly. Sew them into the lining of your of your corset, exactly. Just takes longer to shoot you. Now, paper money is not going to probably add the same kind of protection that the jewels in the corsets did. But... You obviously don't know how I roll. Nice. <laughs> it's just quarters. I've sewn so many quarters into. <laughs> They also had a very large number of cattle that they were bringing with them because they were going to start a new life, right? So food won't be an issue. No, no, no. No issues with food. These cattle aren't technically for them to eat on the way. They're there so they can set up, uh, you know, ranches and things once they get to California. But they are an option to eat, obviously, if you have them. The reeds actually have a pretty unusual wagon. Uh, So they have two normal wagons that you would picture as like a covered wagon type I can think of see right now. I can see it in my mind's eye. Yep. Filled with provisions, including a collection of books and an unused new cooking stove. But their family wagon gets called a Pioneer Palace car. It's double-decker with an entrance on the side like how a stagecoach has. The top level had their beds for sleeping, and the bottom level had these comfortable high-backed seats and a tiny sheet iron stove with the stovepipe running up through the top of the wagon. And I imagine it was the very definition of conspicuous. (laughs) They're just like the people with a really fancy RV at the campsite and everyone else is in tents. Exactly. Yes, that's exactly them. And some of that is because they were traveling. James Reed was traveling with his elderly mother-in-law and wanted her to be comfortable and he could afford to do it but also they obviously had the money exactly why not so they met up with a party led by a colonel russell and were accepted into the group and this was at independence missouri and so this was now 98 men 50 women 46 wagons and 350 cattle colonel russell later wrote that the reeds and donners were highly respectable and intelligent gentlemen with interesting families i know some people with interesting families in my time (laughs) doesn't mean i like them (laughs) Interesting families. Wow, what a quirky house. I love that uh, that description changes based on just how you choose to say the word interesting, right? With interesting families. With interesting families. With interesting families. <laughs> uh, I wasn't expecting you to have families. <laughs> so this group is basically now a little traveling town. Right. And decided that there should be some sense of order and rule of law for their little society. This is how Eliza Donner describes it. Quote, the government of these immigrant trains was essentially democratic and characteristically American. A captain was chosen and all plans of action and rules and regulations were proposed at a general assembly and accepted or rejected by majority vote. Consequently, Colonel Russell's function was to preside over meetings, lead the train, locate camping ground, select crossings over fordable streams, and direct the construction of rafts and other expedients for transportation over deep waters. End quote. Ah, yes. American democracy, like the Salem witch trials. (laughs) Yep, a shining example of why America is the greatest country in the world. The great shining city on the hill. That's right. That's right. Blessed by God. Was that gunfire? Did anyone else hear gunfire? Oh, no, that just happens all the time, every day. That's it. Dark. Buckle up. It gets darker, everyone. There was also a committee assigned to settle disputes. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yeehaw. (laughs) (laughs) Yeehaw! They got rid of the yeehaw at the end of the Declaration of Independence, whatever that, you know. Uh, The the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance, of course. There is still a yeehaw at the end of the uh, Declaration of Independence. There is. I I believe that was John Hancock's doing. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wrote that. People think that's his name written that big, but it's actually yeehaw. He's just, his writing was really illegible. It's bad handwriting. So this system of decision making is going to come into play later. Uh, The committee assigned to settle disputes uh, and the way leadership decisions were made. And this is going to be one of the reasons that we know this whole event as the Donner Party and not the Donner Reed Party and also not the Donna Reed Party. <laughs> which is a joke i did not write into the script i just thought of just now so i said well it. done pretty good <laughs> right that's why you're watching that's pretty good. why you're here 
everything is really going pretty smoothly. The accounts talk about the beauty of the country they're traveling through, the camaraderie they're building with their fellow travelers, the animals they're seeing and hunting, the joy of horseback riding and fresh, uncivilized air. It probably was amazing. I've driven across the country. It is a beautiful, it's beautiful. I mean, it's amazing the different terrain that is in the United States. It really is. Did they have to watch out for engines? Yes. I mean, for the most part, everyone, at this point in the journey especially, any Native Americans they came across were mm. not aggressive. It was just like, okay. They had good experiences until they get a little farther west um, where there's some conflict going on already and things get a little yeah. more dicey. But I mean, the thing is, it's like it really depends with which Native American tribe you end yep. up being interacting with and what's going on with them at the time. Yes. You know, it's not mm -hmm. like it's not like it's a homogenized group of it's people not who are all the same it's very customs and yeah. rules. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's like the the Native Americans that are going to be Missouri way are not going to be the same that are in the Sierra Nevada. Exactly. Right? Uh, yeah, they're going to be totally different, completely different societies. Yeah. So the first death of the many to come occurs very early in the trip. Sarah Keyes, Virginia Reed's grandmother, James Reed's mother-in-law, who insisted on traveling with her daughter across the country, even though she had two sons willing to take her in, still in Illinois, uh, died on May 29th. So very early into the trip. She was 75, and she wasn't really in good health for a trip like this. She just died of old age, basically. I mean, 70, what year was this? 1846. 1856. So, I mean... That's kind of getting on in years, right, at that time, I suppose. It's not yes. ancient by any means, but it is. It's not young. And people die of old age younger than that, I suppose. Yeah. The sad part is, is that she won't be able to be buried in any kind of family graveyard. I imagine they had to bury her on the road, right? They did, yeah. She was buried under an oak tree by the Big Blue River at Independence Crossing. And they carved a stone to mark her grave. So they're not far if it's Independence Crossing. Yes. Um, it's May 29th. They've been on the road for like two weeks or something. Wow. Yeah. It Which, happens very early. I mean, two weeks on the road, you'd think you'd be, off, you know, you think about being on the road two weeks in America. Well, if you're walking, you might not even be out the state yet, you know? They travel on average in their wagons and stuff, usually around 10 miles a day. That's not very far. It's not very that. far. That's why it takes I could, six months to do this trip. <laughs> I could skip 10 miles in like f four or five hours, probably. <laughs> Is there a memorial to her now at that tree, do you reckon? I think Surely there, there is. is. I believe, yes, there Some type is of a little plaque or a rock. The rock's still there marking her grave. I believe there is uh, a little plaque it's, or something there. They founded the town Little Rock after her. <laughs> That's in Arkansas, but... The travelers actually named this area Alcove Spring, and one of them described it as one of the most romantic spots I ever saw, filled with trees and a waterfall, which does sound really nice. He also described it as romantic before Sarah Keys died. That was written in his journal, like, the day before she died. So, you know, he wasn't like, Fair death, enough. romantic. He wasn't a goth, you know, is what I'm saying. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just turned on now. I just, uh, I can't help it. It's just how I'm grieving. <laughs> <laughs> it's just how I'm grieving. <laughs> Within a couple of weeks, the first signs of tension are starting to show. A letter written by Tamsin Donner, who's George Donner's wife, states... We have of the best people in our company, and some, too, that are not so good. Burn. Oh my god, it's scandalous. Spill in the tea, Tamsin, or should I say Karen? It's not your mom, is it? <laughs> no, my mom's name is Karen, everyone. It's no, it. I just love this idea. It's so passive. And some, too, that are not so good. I remember meeting your mom. She was on a Target car park laying down on the floor outside where the shopping carts are put back right, claiming right. that someone had run her over <laughs> mom if you're listening to this um we love you i like your mom she's great yeah i like my mom too the halfway point of the oregon trail was marked by independence rock in wyoming they've got so much time to think of names for places 
en route. And they call it Independence Town, Independence Crossing, and Independence Rock. Americans I suppose are very proud of our independence from England, I suppose. I guess if you are on a trail, you want things to be named the same as you go along, so you know you're still on the trail, right? <laughs> I don't know why it's, it's like... called Independence Rock. <laughs> It just seems very American. Everything's just named Independence, right? It's like in the UK, every pub is like Sheep's Head Pub or whatever. You know what I mean? It's like everything. There's just like the same name over and over. Do you know why pubs in the UK have got names like Black Dog, Red Bear, the old hag, you know? They've got names like that because most people who would frequent those pubs back in time were illiterate. So they had to know what the pub was by the symbology of the pub. So, oh, this must be the black goat because there's a picture of a black goat on the wall. So this is the place. So now you know. Now we know. So this halfway point was marked by Independence Rock in Wyoming, a large granite rock about 130 feet high, almost 2,000 feet long, and 850 feet wide. And I'm not converting that to meters. If you reached it by the 4th of I July. Think of things in, I think of things like that in feet. Okay, good. That makes sense in feet. Okay, good. Only some, something's only meters if it's just tall. Okay. It doesn't make sense, but carry on. If you reached this by the 4th of July, Independence Day, you were on schedule. So many immigrants carved their name into the rock, it became known as the Great Register of the Desert. So I guess people have always had the decision to write that they was here on things. Yeah. <laughs> you should see the, they've got preserved <laughs> graffiti in places like Pompeii, for instance. Wow. Humans be human in, you know? They actually found some graffiti on Hadrian's Wall recently, I believe. Or I heard about it recently. They're talking about it. And it's just a picture of a cock. No way. Exactly <laughs> like you would think. <laughs> on an abandoned railway track, exactly like that. People have been doing that forever. Our party didn't reach Independence Rock until July 16th. Idiots! And while there, a lone rider delivered to them an open letter written by Lansford Hastings. Hastings had a guidebook about traveling to Oregon and California, and in this letter advertised that he had found a new, shorter path to California. This Hastings cutoff meant going to Fort Bridger rather than Fort Hall and crossing the Great Salt Lake Desert. And that's why we say make haste now. Make haste, that's exactly. Did you know that's why we say make haste? That's why we say that. And you can say that fact to your friends and family and say you heard it on Remember, Remember, the that's podcast. Right. That's all true. That's all true and factually <laughs> accurate. <laughs> Hastings claimed that this path would save 200 miles of travel and that he would meet interested parties at Fort Bridger and guide them along the cutoff. Did it? Yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of deliberation about whether this shortcut should be used. The Donners and James Reed all thought it was worth taking the shortcut, and people associated with Fort Bridger vouched for it. But not everyone wanted to take the risk, so the party split, and George Donner was put in charge of the Hastings Cutoff Group, thus yeah. creating the Donner Without Party, which was made up of 87 people. So most people then? Quite a few of them. At this point, they were, this was probably like half, half of the group that they were with before. Okay. Uh, though when they were with Captain Russell, I think it was. Kurt. Yeah, with, when they were with Kurt Russell, some of those people were going to Oregon. So some of them were going to split off anyway, because at some gotcha. point the trails diverge. But even the people who still wanted to go to California, some of them were like, no, we'll take the way up on the, the, the trail we all know to Fort Hall. And 87 people decided, no, we'll go with the Donners and the Reeds and take this cutoff. Put yourself in that position right now. What would you have done? You're two weeks late already. You can save 200 miles of journey, which is... And people say, yeah, this is legit. I mean, it makes sense to do, right? You're told by someone who's written a guidebook that this is a shortcut that you can and should be taking. 
Yeah. I probably would have gone on the original trail and not I taken the I think I would have because it's the devil you know, you know, but you can understand why they thought this was a good idea to do. Absolutely. Also, you have to put into the this whole thing and the extra factor of how sick of being on the road they must have been by now. Yeah, they're, what, halfway through? So they've been doing this for like three months or so. And you're thinking, point? I will do anything to spend 20 less days on the road. Are you crazy? Yes. And so. yeah, the closer they get to September and October, the the more likely they're going to run into bad weather, which is a, or they might start running out of supplies, you know, like all these things. Like, it makes sense. Like, let's get, and apparently like James Reed specifically was very, just wanted, it was like, I'm ready to be there. I want to be in California. I want to have our new life. I want to be doing this thing. And so he was like, yeah, let's get there sooner. Let's save 200 miles. So these 87 people was 29 men, 15 women, and 43 children. So it's a lot of families. It's all families moving west, right? There were the Breens, the Keysbergs, the Murphys, the Eddies, the Pikes, the Fosters, the McCutcheons, Mr. and Mrs. Wolfinger, and a handful of single men. Patrick Dolan, Charles Stanton, Samuel Shoemaker, Hardcoop and Spitzer. They don't have first names for some reason. I don't know why people didn't seem to know or write down their first names, but Hardcoop, Spitzer. Joseph Reinhardt, James Smith, Walter Heron, and Luke Halloran. Did you say the Breens? The Breens, yes. Aren't they the weird bad guys from Deep Space Nine? That's the Breen, right? They kind of look like Boba Fett. Yeah. It's a deep Star Trek cut. That is a deep cut. Okay, yeah. Also, I know Murphy's in California. Perhaps (gasps) that's how they got there. Oh my gosh, I didn't even think about that. We do know Murphys who ended up in Northern California. There's a lot of Murphys. In- we should ask and see if they can trace their lineage back to these Murphys. Well, these Murphys don't make it, so no, I some imagine. of them might. Some of them do. Some of okay. them do, yeah. And they ended up in the right part of the state. There's also the Graves family, but they technically don't join up until after the party has left Fort Bridger. But they're already mm-hmm. included in this number of 87 people. Graves is a great last name. Graves. Fort Bridger. They arrive expecting Hastings to be there, as promised, to guide them. (laughs) Right? Reasonable expectation, I would say. Very much so, considering that's what he said he was going to do. Well, guess what? (laughs) He's not there. (laughs) He left a week earlier with another party. And he left instructions that anyone else should just follow along behind in their trail. Ten days, like, behind? That doesn't make any sense. So, yeah, the Donner Party's not thrilled. I would be livid. Yeah, they're not very happy. But the people at the fort assure them the path is good. The only tough bit they need to worry about is 40 miles through the Great Salt Lake Desert. That's it. Just 40 miles through the desert. So they set off. And in five days, they reach Weber River, and they're feeling good. They're making good time. But at the river, they spot a note that's been left behind for them from Hastings. You know, like uh, Fernan who plays like Dark Souls? It's like those little blood stains that you like see and someone's left you like... What? Warning. Dog. Yeah. (laughs) So there's a note, and this is a thing I guess people on the trail used to do. They would leave notes and things behind for for people on like under on rocks and on, you know... tagged to like trees and stuff it's really interesting this note from hastings says like hey actually this road ahead of you that i'm currently on with some people it's pretty bad you shouldn't come this way so james reed and pike and stanton get on horseback because you can travel much more quickly just on horseback right? yeah of course you can so they ride ahead along this road to find hastings to be like come back with us and guide us on this alternate route you think we should take. They find him and he refuses to come back with them and is like, I'll just show you where to go. So he takes them up on like a high point and I would have got this guy back with a gun and I would have I would have pointed a gun at him and rode him the way back. He's told us to come this way. He can bloody well leave lead us. He basically like points out and is like, yeah, yeah, see that path? See everywhere the light touches. Uh, he's just like, follow that. Follow that path. That's the way to go. At this point, I should probably say, Hastings was advertising a route 
that he had never actually taken himself. The Hastings cutoff was thoroughly untested and unproven, and the people back on the trail and at Fort Bridger singing its praises, they were being paid by Hastings and by those who might have an investment in getting more travelers to come by Fort Bridger and spend their money rather than Fort Hall. This is so many people's lives at stake and on the on literally on the line to do this. This isn't like oh, there's no there's not going to be a Denny's for 600 miles. No. This is like there's not going to be any form of help or civilization and also there's been a landslide and there's snakes everywhere. Who knows? Whereabouts in the country is this then? Just outside like Salt Lake City? So at this point they're in like uh, Nevada. And they were gambling with their lives. <laughs> That's a good joke. The Donner Party tries to avoid panicking and they move forward attempting to follow Hastings' instructions. But they keep getting turned around and doubling back. And remember earlier we were talking about how there was a path? The Oregon Trail is a path, like a road, basically, that's already cleared and you can just travel it. That doesn't exist here. So they keep having to actually cut and clear the path to make way for their wagons. Like their wagons are big. They're so big that they're pulled by four oxen. So they're having to stop and cut, clear a path to get their wagons through, meaning they go from traveling 10 miles in a day to more like one or maybe two. They finally reach the Great Salt Lake after 30 days. It was supposed to have taken them a week to get there. It's on this shore that the second death occurs. Luke Halloran, who had tuberculosis, he dies of tuberculosis. Would you have gone back at this to point, the fort? It was too... Apparently, at this point, they were like, it's too late to go back. We just have to keep going forward. We've made it to the desert. It's only 40 miles, and then it's going to be fine. We're going to be back to where we, we meet up again. Back on the Oregon on the Trail, main path. yeah. Yeah. So the group rests and stocks up on grass for their livestock and water for everyone, knowing that in four days, they'll be across this desert. Except... It isn't 40 miles across the desert, like they were told. It's 80 miles. Three days in, they've run out of feed and water. The days are so hot, the wagons are getting stuck in the muck of the sand. The nights are so cold because it's a freaking desert and windy that oxen are like suffocating from the sand being blown on them. And people are struggling to stay warm enough through the night. Cattle are literally like going mad with thirst and running away, trying to find water. People are worried that they're going to start dying of thirst as they watch their cattle start dying of thirst. And of course, the immediate issue beyond dying of thirst is that without animals to pull their wagons, families have to start leaving behind belongings, sometimes whole wagons, which means they're not just leaving behind like their collection of books. Some of that is like supplies Everything. that they yeah. need these losses and the loss of so many animals are going to have <laughs> dire consequences later they're on, are they on foot at this point then they're like we've just got to start some walking. of them there are still wagons but some of them are leaving behind like so if you think about like the reed family had three wagons yeah so at this point um they have abandoned their pioneer palace and one of their other wagons and taken just whatever they feel like they need, put it in wow. one wagon, and are now just have one of their three left. God. It's now September. After five grueling days in the desert that come out on the other side, but they've lost 36 of their cattle. The Reed's entire herd is gone at this point. Four wagons have been left behind. The Reeds don't have any more of their oxen. Like I said, they abandon their Pioneer Palace. Other members of the party lend them some oxen so that they can pull one single wagon. At this point, they realize they are way behind schedule. And they've had to abandon so much, they don't have the supplies they need to reach California. Because this actually hasn't been a shortcut. <laughs> Charles Stanton 
who is uh, a single man, uh, is unattached, does not have a family with him, and William McCutcheon, who has a wife and a young son. In the, uh, they leave the party on horseback to ride ahead to Fort Sutter in California, where they can ask for aid to put on mules and bring back to the party, basically, to help them um, survive to California. Yeah. Things were going so well, and now they're just all going to hell. And the worst is definitely not behind them. It's still to come. And we're going to talk about that and how the Donner Pass in Truckee, California got its name, and also why I can't bring myself to eat Donner Kebab in part I'm so two. engrossed in this story. <laughs> I wanted to tell you the rest. <laughs> Well, if you feel the same way, you're going to have to uh, tune in next week for part two of what happens with the Donner Party. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Remember, Remember. We just appreciate you being here. Yeah. If you want to wangle the dangle down downstairs, then you can. Tick that button and <laughs> like and all that type of stuff. That's, That's what they the do. That's new way YouTubers are saying like and subscribe. Just... Wangle the dangle downstairs. That's what we want you to do. That's the new smash that like button. That's exactly. Destroy the like button. If you want to listen to these shows just as a podcast and not sat in your room in front of your computer with your eyes closed, and you can just download the podcast. <laughs> it is available for you to listen to at your convenience, wherever you get podcasts. And just the main thing that you can do for us and your country. Ask not what your podcast can do for you. Ask what you can do for your podcast. Yes. Tell someone who you think might like the show about the show. Tell your friends. Tell a blog post. Tell uh, someone saying, I don't know what to listen to on Twitter. Say, hey, you like history? And these guys, picture of us. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs> we appreciate you so much. Thank you, Paula. You're welcome, Matthew. And we'll see you next time. Bye, Bye. everyone.